Good morning. My name is Kim Haven, and I am the Legislative Liaison for Interfaith Action for Human Rights. And I'm here today to talk about HB 67. We have been blessed and very grateful for the support that you have given us over the last several years as we've worked on this issue. And I am grateful for the opportunity to come back before you and ask for your support once again. We do believe that this will be the year that we can actually pass this piece of legislation. By way of sort of introduction to the topic, so those of you that may not know, um, the video was kind of just a, I don't want to say a cute way, but it was sort of an engaging way to draw people into the conversation about what we were talking about. By way of background, we have been working on this issue for several years, and it started with a really big bill we wanted to just kind of like dismantle all of restrictive housing solitary confinement and it was really unwieldy but the legislators um, identified four discrete groups that solitary confinement or restrictive housing was really problematic for them were juveniles pregnant individuals individuals with serious mental illness and direct release with support of organizations such as you, we were able to pass legislation that uh, banned the use of restrictive housing for juveniles, that it banned the use of restrictive housing for pregnant individuals, which by the way, was the first in the nation legislation that was passed that protected pregnant individuals. And those with serious mental illness. Serious mental illness is a very wieldy thing because there's so many layers to how do you identify, who identifies, what actually qualifies as. And so Disability Rights Maryland is now waging that battle um, in the court system. And so we will have to see how that plays out. Um, but the fourth group and the group that I'm here today to talk about is those individuals that are released directly from restrictive housing back into the community. The practice has always been um, to just take somebody and release them into the community. And the number was always right around 325, 350 individuals a year. So we're not talking a lot of individuals. However, we're talking about individuals. And every year, like I said, it would be between 325, 300. And we passed a law several years ago that required them to report out on the numbers and that's how we know this number and these individuals are just released because it's their release date they are either at expiration or they are mandatory whatever the reason is they're just released this is problematic obviously because individuals who as you saw in that cute little video i gotta stop saying cute in that video um are subjected to a variety of harms and they're taking that back into the community. I am fond of saying that what we do to, what we don't do for or with, those that are incarcerated is what they bring back to our communities. And individuals who have been in restrictive housing for any period of time bring all of that back into our community. We know from uh, research, we know from best practices, that anything over 15 days in that environment is actually considered torture. And so these individuals, because the state is adamant that they're not going to hold anybody past their mandatory release date, which, thank goodness, um, they were just releasing them without any sort of transition back into the community. And so we wrote this bill and we just, again, we're way backward, background, we had it all the way to the Senate. Um, it was getting ready to be voted on. And it was the year that Speaker Bush passed away. And so they ended session early so that everybody could go pay their respects to the family. The public, Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services, while we were on third reader, the clock was counting down. The department, um, in the department representative called Senator Cassily out of uh, Harford County and told him to stall. And so he special ordered the bill. And the next bill that was called was a bill that pitted Jill Carter and Mary Washington, and they got into a shouting match and the clock ran out. Then COVID hit, then police reform, both critical issues, don't get me wrong. This is our year. 
what this bill does is this provides for individuals who are in restrictive housing the ability to be transitioned back into their community or transitioned back into general population. The department's position has always been that they didn't have the resources to be able to do this. With COVID, and this is going to sound weird, there's been good and bad in COVID. And the good in COVID is that our prison population was in fact decreased by about 9%. 9% is better than nothing, right? But they did rec they did reduce our prison population and they hired a whole cadre of new social workers. So that was their big pushback. This year, they, they can't put that in there because they now have the social workers and our population is less. What is particularly troubling um, from COVID is that quite honestly, every single person who was incarcerated was released from, direct, from uh, restrictive housing. I'm not saying that they have to do this massive amount of work for every individual leaving, but we do know that in this year, in 2022, it is almost uh, 1,600 people that are projected to be released. And they provide transitional services, whether it's through making sure they have IDs, making sure they've got a safe place to live, do they have a mental health provider on the outside, do they have substance use um, counselors if they need that, but they always overlook the direct release. This legislation would mandate that they provide within 180 days of someone's release date, they provide that same level of services that they're doing for general population to those individuals that are in restrictive housing. Why is this important? Individuals who are in restrictive housing don't have the ability to make the same kind of phone calls for jobs, for housing, for family reunification, for getting back with their children. And this legislation would make the department provide those same opportunities to them. The, the legislation says that if somebody is in restrictive housing, then the staff at the institution has to take that same level of service to the individual where they are housed. This is important because again, when somebody comes home, everything that's happened to them, they're bringing back into our communities. And so this truly is a public safety threat. I don't say that lightly. I don't say that easily, but it is in fact a truth. We do not know the number this year, or I mean, for last year, for 2021, um, of the numbers of individuals that were released directly from restrictive housing, non-COVID related, because the department has failed to file those reports for the last two years. They were legislatively mandated to provide them by December 31st of every year. They are now two years behind. That's why this bill is so critical. I come before you today and I ask for your support for HB 67. This is a critical piece of legislation if we're really going to be serious about how we release individuals from incarceration, what we do to, what we do for, what we do with to prepare individuals to return back to all of our communities. I would be grateful. And on behalf of IAHR, its staff, its board, its volunteers, its interns, we would be grateful for your continued support for this legislation. We do in fact have a bill hearing. It is February 1st at one o'clock in the House Judiciary. We would love your support. We would love your written testimony. We would love it if you would reach out to the members of the House Judiciary Committee and urge them to pass this bill. Let this be the year that we address the fourth group of individuals that the legislators were, pro were that the legislators were concerned about. Sorry, I thought I was going to sneeze there for a second. Um, that they were concerned about. This is good legislation. This is proactive legislation. This is good policy. Please help us with HB 67. If you have any questions, I am certainly available. My email is KimberlyHaven at gmail.com and my phone number is 443-987-3959. I thank you for your time this morning and I look forward to working with you all again this year to pass this legislation. Thank you so much. Have a great day.